Hi, I'm Cinciana Cojocarescu and this is Nico Vocari. We are both co-founders of Besna Theatre, a British-Romanian theatre company dedicated to challenging institutionalized and normalized violences in our society. Today we're launching GLOD Political Theatre as a Civil Right, an online theatre platform showcasing every two weeks political theatre from around the world. Um, each session will be followed by a discussion with activists, academics and artists who will be talking about the issues that each of the piece explores. Tonight you'll be watching Illegalized, the show that we co-wrote and directed together in the UK uh, spring 2019. Illegalized is the first part of a theatre protest cycle that we're currently working on that aims to uh, challenge and expose various aspects of Britain's violent colonial past and present. Uh, Illegalized was the result of a long fieldwork project that we did in 2018 and 2019 where we spoke um, to many activist, art, uh, activist academics and um, those that were subjected to and have been subjected to the violence of the Home Office's migration and asylum policies. Um, throughout the discussion we'll be taking questions from you, the audience, so you can send those over via Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Our handle is Besna Theatre or just look for Besna Theatre. Um, and you can also send those uh, via email at contact at besnatheatre.org. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and standing with us in solidarity. I knew you'd be waiting for me 
with open arms, just like you said you would. Did I ever say thank you for democracy, Great Britain? Did I ever say thank you for justice, Great Britain? Did I ever say thank you for defending human rights, Great Britain? Did I ever say thank you for your language, Great Britain? Did I ever say thank you for the dream, Great Britain? Or for the schools, for the roads, science? Yes. Well, that's 
really interesting because that doesn't look like you at all. But that's me. Don Diesta to pass Porto. But we know you're not Spanish. Where are you really from? Okay, you can't do this. Sit down. How old are you? When were you born? How long have you been in the UK? How long have you worked here? It's a bit early to be playing this game, don't you think? Just answer the question. You're not answering, it's just proving to us you have no right to be here. Alright, we can't make it all. Can I have a scanner? Alright, I'm going to need you to spread your fingers so I can ascertain exactly who you are. Is that really necessary? Yes. yes. Okay.
There's a sound of the vandals shouting. Your fault. 
You would blame Apollos if you could. It's not right to make us live this way. Look, you should be grateful that you've got a fucking place to stay. Besides, I thought you were desperate to get out of your country. We're all here for different reasons. I was never rich, but I never lived in a place like this. Your company, me is, they're killing us. Daddy! Look, we answered to the home office. Could you live on five pounds a day? I don't have to, I work. Five pounds a day to buy food, clothes, medicines, soaps, detergents, drugs, poison. I can't sleep. I worry about my children, right? I worry about their future. What's your name? Oh, don't bring her into this. My children are Solomon and Delilah. And what is the difference between your child and mine? They're innocent. They deserve a new life. They've done nothing wrong. Don't you think I'm talking to her? Don't you think Stop I'm talking to her? My, my hands are cut off. I can't feed my children. I can't keep them safe. I'm not allowed to work. Just calm down. That's your bedroom window, isn't it? Hmm? Yes, why is the light still on? It's nearly 8 o'clock and the sun is out. Electricity is expensive, yeah? Start turning your light off, pal. Around the world, broadcasters carried the news from overseas, British naval officers. For the country. The other side of the Atlantic, a message from President. Could not be happier. On the joyous, on the joyous, on the joyous. Could not be happier. Most traditional of ways. There's a large crowd gathered for the country. Coming out, putting up the bunting, putting out the flags, and saying. Congratulations. On the joyous. That the guards uh, might strike up with. Congratulate. The interviewer asks a question. Wouldn't miss it for the world. <laughs> We've been here since what? Uh, quarter past five. In the morning. <laughs> Set the alarm for 3.30. You had to make sure we got a decent spot. Yes, yes. Not done too badly either. It's starting to fill up. We've got quite a good view, so. Yes, yeah, so everyone's out today. You know, by the looks of things, the whole city's going to come along. That's what I love about these things. It's that sense of community, isn't it? It brings everyone together. The interviewer asks a question. The most British person. Uh, the Queen. Oh, yes! <laughs> you can't get more British than her! It's quintessentially British. The interviewer asks a question. Very proud. I mean, how can you not be? Well, that's why we're here, isn't it? I mean, I wouldn't get up at 3.30 and stand in the freezing cold for anything else, let me tell you. The interviewer asks a question. I'm proud of the basic goodness that's in the people of this country. Yes, we're an honest people. Yes, and there's a sense of generosity as well. You know, you think of all the countries that we've gone to and helped to uh, progress. As some might even say same. Yes, I mean, we gave them everything, didn't we? Uh, infrastructure, science. Uh, Christianity. Freedom. What's going on over there? Are they, are they taking him away? It looks like he's homeless. Oh, yeah. Would rather than spoiling the view now, would they? No. <laughs> Tis a celebration after all. And foreign, I think. Oh, uh, yeah. Romanian, aren't they? But uh, we were talking about why we're proud. Yes! You think of all the countries we've gone to and given freedom. I think it's at the heart of everything we do. I think it's at the heart of everything we stand for. Freedom. And liberty. Freedom, liberty. Equality. Yes. We have been trying to make the world a more equal place. And I think we've done a bloody good job of it as well. I think it's in our blood. What's in our blood? Freedom. <laughs> I really do. Hmm. Yes, you're probably right, actually.
Alright, you ready? Yes? Nervous? No. I am a little bit. Why? Like it's my first interview. Uh, really? Shall we begin? Yes. And I just want to assure you that this interview is completely confidential. So anything that you share is just between me and you. Okay? Okay. Well, I'm recording this interview today because you've made this request. Is that correct? Uh, yes. And you do not have legal aid with you today? No, no money. Are you fit and well to be interviewed today? Yes. And do you wish to make any amendments to your screening interview? What? Uh, do you want to change what you said to us before? What did I say? Yeah, in your screening interview. You know, when you first spoke to somebody, do you want to oh. change what you said or not? No. no. Right, you haven't submitted a statement. Statement. Yeah, a letter in which you write why you're afraid to go back what you're basing your claim on. I know to know. Well, that was in the interview letter you were sent. Okay. Do you understand that I'm here today to assess whether or not you're entitled to protection from the British government? Protection? Yes. Right, great. So when did you arrive in the UK? Uh, three or four days. Right, is that three or four? First, I go uh, police, uh, police station, they arrest me, three or four days. Mm -hmm. But was that three or four? Yes. Right, so how many days were you at the police station for? Uh, two days. Right. You see, I thought you just said it was three or four. Three or four days, yes. I'm really not getting this. Yeah. When did you arrive in the UK? I arrived three or four days. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Where were you born? Uh, zero one zero one nine zero. Yeah, of course. Why did you come to the UK? Why? Yeah. Why did you come to the UK? Uh, protection. Yeah, for protection. Yes. But why do you need protection? Uh, I am a refugee. Yeah, sure. But why do you need to receive protection in the UK? Yeah, um, why are you a refugee? Uh, um, because in my country it is not safe. In my country I am in danger. I must go. Okay, why isn't it safe? Uh, fighting bombs. My family in danger. I must go. Where did you come from? Uh, Call it. Right. Not making this easy for me, are you? How did you get to Calais? I take a train. Right. And where were you before that? Country, I don't know your name. Yeah. Okay. Where were you born? Uh, Afghanistan. Right. When did you leave? Uh, one year. And how did you get into the UK? Three or four days. I tell no. You. no, no, no. How? How? Yeah. Car, plane, or oh, car, 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 big car. Okay. So lorry. What? A truck. A truck. Yes, yes, truck. Um, I try and try every day, but I not get there. Uh, police um, beat me every day. Wet, border control shout. Police beat every day. I run, but one day I get there. Did anybody help you get into the UK? Yes, many people. Uh, hey. uh, for job bar, uh, many people in college. Um, many English people. English people. Yes. Uh, give food, uh, teach English. Right. Right. <laughs> Why is that? I am happy, London, protection. Not just yet. What? Well, you haven't got protection just yet. Yeah? yeah, I'm here to decide whether or not you're entitled to refugee status. I am a refugee. Yeah, well, that's what I will be deciding on. So why do you choose the UK? Why choose? Yeah, why not claim asylum in France? Oh, UK is a good country, good rights, um, many Afghans here, big community, many I want to start a new life. So can you tell me what date you arrived in the UK? Did? Yeah. What date was it? Uh, three or four days. Yeah, right, so you don't know the day. Or what date is today? So tell me about the war at home. Tell you what? And tell me why I should offer you protection in this country. Yeah? Why are you here? See how man. This is difficult. Well, well you probably shouldn't have told them that this was your first interview. I don't know. I thought you might make him trust me more. Let that humanize me. I mean, fair enough. Like... Come on! Keep going. It's not time for a break yet. I'm right, sorry. So, 
tell me, why are you here? And why should I offer you protection from the British government? Because in my country, it is not safe. In my country, in Afghanistan, I am in danger. The Taliban, the fighters, they want me to fight, but I don't like fighting. I am not political. So they attack me, they attack my family. No, sorry. You said you're not political. Yes. Then why are they interested in you? They want me to fight, but why? I don't know why. If I'm to offer you protection in this country, then I need to assess exactly why you need it. So please, collaborate. Okay. Alright, so tell me exactly what happened with the Taliban. The Taliban. They come to the village. They ask you man to fight. And if you not go, they take you. And if you not go, they kill you. Did they ask you to go man? Yes, of course. They say you must go, but I say no, I run. Right. I don't like fighting. Yeah, and what else? The Tolobo, they come to my house. They're looking for me, but I run. And I hear my mother scream, shouting, crying. I run back for my sister. She stopped me. She said, she said my papa is dead. I want to die. I want to kill the man that killed my papa. But she said, no. It is not safe. You must go. I'm sorry. Did you really say that? Like, sorry, I don't care. Because, like, I mean, I think there's a nice stuff. What she said. Now, like, they don't really want to talk about how they feel, which is why it's easy to dismiss the claims. Well, they're all different, aren't they? You get some subs that are quite emotional, and you get some subs that just they don't really open up. Come on, just keep going. Ah, <laughs> uh, fuck. I missed it. Uh, what's that? The discrepancy. Yeah? He said that if you don't go with them, they kill you. But then he's just said that he said no, and there seems to be no immediate consequence. I mean, it's not like the Taliban just come and check up on you later, is it? Oh, uh, man. It's hard. Not your heart. Money is made. At 
Afghanistan, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Cameroon, China, the northern part of Cyprus, Dominican Republic, Egypt, Equatorial Guinea, Eritrea, Fiji, Gambia, Ghana, Guyana, India, Indonesia, Iran, Iraq, Jamaica, Jordan, Kenya, Kuwait, Lesotho, Liberia, denied. Gratitude, such a foreign concept it seems. No word of thanks for infrastructure. No humble bow of the head for safeguarding their ancestral art. Instead, the natives rise. They want it back. My millions from our homes, my billions come to our shores, my trillions. Libya, Madagascar, Malawi, Myanmar, Nigeria, Oman, Pakistan, Palestine, Philippines, Qatar, Rwanda, Saudi Arabia, Sierra Leone, Somalia, South Africa, South Sudan, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Suriname, Swaziland, Tanzania, Uganda, United Arab Emirates, Yemen, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Denied. The globe itemized, lines we drew, lands we carved. Lovely, disgruntled natives perform their distress for a free pass into our great land to take my my love, my beauty, my comfort, war, poverty, and silence. Why don't they just sort it out? Corruption, discrimination, and silence. We have no choice but to put up visas to keep them out, away from the riches we brought home. Afghanistan, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Cameroon, China, the northern part of Cyprus, Dominican Republic, Egypt, Equatorial Guinea, Eritrea, Fiji, Gambia, Ghana, Guyana, India, Indonesia, Iran, Iraq, Jamaica, Jordan, Kenya, Kuwait, Lesotho, Liberia, Libya, Madagascar, Malawi, Myanmar, Nigeria, Oman, Pakistan, Philippines, Qatar, Rwanda, Saudi Arabia, Sierra Leone, South Africa, South Sudan, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Suriname, Swaziland, Tanzania, Uganda, United Arab Emirates, Yemen, Zambia, and Zimbabwe.
Yes. One more. Lovely. That's the one. Are you alone? I'm alone. Just me. Where are you from? Darfur. Where? Darfur, Sudan. Well, do you have a passport? No. Why are you getting into the UK without a passport? One chance. Oh, I'm okay, I'm afraid. How did you get in the vehicle? One chance, please. How did you get in the vehicle? Oh, please. Oh, no, stop asking. Why? Because. Why? Well, rules, mate. Come on. There we go.
I killed myself because I do not have a life to live anymore. I can't return to my country because it's not safe for us. If I return, I will be tortured. Solomon and Delilah will be better off without me. I want them to have good homes, to become British citizens. This is my decision. Answer phone. Answer phone. Contract Lena's phone rings. Hello. She fresh mom, we is la munca. Come a colo. She fresh mom, what a bee, you it is la munca. It's a disc of the seed of munca, la familia, la la lucas la mamma. I fuck a curat, my my cumber de mucare, my fuck she de mucare. She's fucked up, bitch, and not. Da, dar ce se întâmplă cu Brexit-ul și ea? Că am auzit la televizor. Mamă, nici ei nu știu, nici noi nu știm, nimeni nu știe. Om vedea ce se întâmplă la nimeni, ce se întâmplă la nimeni. Nu știm dacă se mai stăm la muncă sau nu, dar până atunci, aia e, noi muncim cu drag și spor. Ce se face? Dar cum se comportă lumea acolo cu tine? E bine? Da, nu, dar normal, dar cum? Ei se comportă foarte frumos și se, a, mamă, să-i vreau să-i vezi pe toți la costume pe stradă, să știi, știi ce urmă? Deși te-am sunat, uite, nu mamă, în legătură cu Maria, încă nu mai știu, mamă, ce să-i fac, că nu vrea să învețe, să știi că iar la patru, la matematică și nu la patru. Tu, mamă, și de aici și ce vrea să fac, zi și mie. Dă-i mâna peste șapă, 
Pune copilul să vezi, eu, eu, ce vrea să ajung, vrea să curețe WC-uri, asta vrea să fac, eu de aici ce vrei să fac? Trage una peste cap și pune-l cu burta pe carte. Uite, o să... O să-ți trimit eu mai mult bani, dar vreau să fii, să trimit copilul la meditație. O să trimit să tu la meditație. Bine, tu hai că te las, că tu ești la muncă și eu te țin din treabă. Să știi că ne e tare și să știi că Maria plânge în fiecare Bine, zi. Bine, mamă, hai că eu trebuie să mă duc la muncă acum, da? Că mă strică femeia asta. Hai că uh, vă sun eu săptămâna viitoare. Eu am treabă acum, da? Pupă-l pe Maria din partea mea și uh, ai închide tu că trebuie să mă duc la muncă. Pa, pa! You're done. You're my nearest cleaner. I'm going to text you the address. Oh, okay, but, but I, I won't finish it in time. No, 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 no. This is overtime. Ah, oh, okay, okay. I will go. But uh, when do you pay me for the overtime I did last month? Uh, sorry, darling. I don't deal with payments. You're going to have to talk to finance about that. Yes, well, but they always say soon, don't worry. Yes, I'm sure they'll sort it out as soon as they can. Uh, also, a note for the future. When I don't pick up my phone, it means that I'm busy and I'll call you back when I'm free. Don't get yes, calling, okay? Sorry. To right. you. No way, I don't have what I need to clean this room. I need more, more disinfectant, more biohazard. Oh, cool. There oh, is a big mess here. I cannot be sure with water. Okay. Bye, 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 Can I have my spot, please? I get it. I must seem strange, intimidating. I say what I think and I don't laugh if it's not funny. I talk loud when I want to be heard and I argue when I disagree. I don't smile to make you feel better for the cheap service you get off my back. I haven't got a choice but accept working conditions you wouldn't even think about. Cause I'm the toilet of Europe. The failure of civilization could almost have been human were I born a little west. The toilet of Europe, land of thieves and hordes and beggars and squatters and communists. We're here and you want to send us back, but you still want to see us on video chat? Pay per minute to see a young girl. She'll household talk she's in her vagina, but you don't want to know where she's from 
again, the thought of her exploitation makes your erection go down. We're here and you want us to go back. But you still want us to boost your economy, make us your consumerist colony, addict us to features we're not born with. And things we can't afford make the poor poorer all over the world. I get it. You find me threatening and intimidating. You don't understand the language I speak or the hand gestures I make because you didn't grow up watching people like me on TV. And the papers. And the news channels. Ah, the news. Tell you to be afraid. Tell you to hate. And you are. And you do. And I work, and I serve, and I sell, and I buy, and I hide, and I scrub. I scrub first world excrement from sweatshop toilet basins with my filthy second world hands. Now, I'm here. I'm the toilet of Europe. I've come to Great Britain. So you can all shit on me. Everyone together now. Because I'm the toilet of Europe. The failure of civilization could almost have been human. Where I born a little west, the toilet of Europe, land of thieves and whores and beggars and squatters and communists. Because I'm the toilet of Europe, the failure of civilization could almost have been human. Where I born a little west, the toilet of Europe, land of thieves and whores and beggars and squatters and communists. Because I'm the toilet of Europe. The failure of civilization could almost have been human. Where I born a little west. The toilet of Europe. Land of thieves and whores and beggars and squatters and communists. Well, remember, ladies and gentlemen, bottom line is we should never expect the detainee 
wings, jump out of the vehicle, skip across the runway, and onto the plane singing all the way. <laughs> so give me a bit out of the job, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but it's all in all seriousness, what do we always need to be ready and prepared to do? Uh, De-escalate and diffuse. One more time. De-escalate and diffuse. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, very, very nice. Okay, so what is the first thing we need to do to the detainee before we transport them from the pre-departure accommodation or removal centre to the airport. I deprocess them. That should have been done by your colleagues at the removal centre. Um, Someone else. Come to a couple of days ago, guys. Um, searching. Or her. Exactly. Search the detainee. They will certainly not be happy little monkeys, and there have been cases of them sneaking in weapons such as razor blades. Weapons? Yeah. They get desperate. They use the weapons to uh, self-harm or commit suicide in transit or in the aircraft itself, claiming that they would rather be dead than go back to their country of origin. Attacking DCOEs is not unheard of either, okay? Any of these situations is a press nightmare and must be avoided at all costs. Yeah? Does that mean that we have to do a cavity search? No, no, no. Luckily for you, that would have already been done by your colleagues at the removal centre. Alright, so, we have a resistant detainee Give me a couple of things we can do to him to get him to comply. Um, so you've got the finger behind the ear? TW17. Very nice, very nice. Come here, you. Yes, you. <laughs> Face that way. Alright. So what you want to do is you want to jump <laughs> right behind the ear. Right? <laughs> Lots of pain. One kill him, we'll get the job done. <laughs>
a clue. Give me a clue. 
Um, before we get questions from um, people who have been watching, um, I'll just start with a few questions that um, we've prepared. Um, and the first question is for you, Monish, uh, and it's about the term illegalized, the title of the play, which we actually found out from you when we interviewed you as part of the fieldwork process. Um, and I was wondering whether you would be able to tell our um, audience a little bit more about the term, why it's not being used so much and how, why it is important to use it. Uh, thanks, Inziana. I think that's that's a very important question, and uh, in a way, I'm glad you asked. So um, I will give you I will give you a long longish answer, uh, and I'll divide my answer into three parts for you. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, when the word when the term illegal migrant gets thrown around, the only image that comes into people's mind is black and brown bodies. It does not refer to illegal migrants from English speaking white majority countries. Uh, the term needs a racialized body uh, without which it is meaningless and uh, unrecognizable. So the illegal migrant is a very, very peculiar criminal construct that targets people's very existence uh, and not necessarily their actions, uh, but the term seriously switches the way they are perceived by the society. So I'm going to give you an example of the deaths of 39 Vietnamese men, women, and children that happened last year. The media recognized the fact that it was a tragedy uh, and then switched the lens to illegal migration. Not necessarily saying that individuals were uh, illegal migrants, but rather they were bought in or they were coming in to work illegally which may or may not be the same thing, but it does produce the same desired effect. The official discourse also turned the attention to the problem of uh, crime and smuggling and so on. Um, therefore, uh, while the victimization was acknowledged, uh, nevertheless, their deaths were racially devalued uh, and soon they were completely out of nation's consciousness. Uh, and we have seen this happening repeatedly, for instance, um, Kali refugees, they're suffering in the jungle camp or um, deaths during crossings as you've shown um, uh, in the play. Uh, everything is put down to illegal migration, uh, thereby removing them from the humanitarian or uh, compassionate lens. Um, this also takes me to point two, uh, which is the construct of illegal migrants. Uh, which not only results in criminalization of racialized bodies, but also racialization of crime, which is the crime of undocumented or uh, unauthorized migration. So it is a construct which is immoral. Uh, it, it, is an, it is constructed as an immoral act uh, that is um, undeserving of sympathy. Uh, however, uh, and and that, that is also un-British and contemptuous. However, unlike most other crimes, being illegal migrant uh, is a crime in itself. Uh, you know, it is a crime of status, of, of these racialized people not having the status uh, and, and not having a status which is in itself considered a crime. Um, and it is understood as a crime uh, of not having a status. So their very lack of existence, their invisibility, or their presence, all of which is uh, constructed as a crime. And this takes me to the third and final point. Uh, crime has no ontological reality, which means crime and, and criminals are constructed and shaped by those in power uh, for their advantage. Therefore, using the term illegalized um, helps us to critically unpack, explore, uh, and, and turn the attention to the processes and practices of um, illegalization, and most importantly, the harm or the impact of becoming illegalized. Yeah, th thank you for that. That's and that's why we decided to choose this as the title because we thought it was so important for people to understand that you know a human being cannot be illegal. Mm. Just some structures can can put some laws and borders in place to to make you to turn you into a criminal. Mm. Um, does anyone else want to add anything uh, to that? No. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. Um, 
So speaking about language, I was wondering whether we could talk a bit more about the uh, role that language actually plays in the demonization of oppressed groups, um, and also how can we use language to fight back against this oppression? And this is open to anyone who wants to jump in. Um, just briefly, I think there is something about uh, the, in order for the people who are actually doing the demonization to like survive doing that job, there is a necessity to dehumanize the people that you're oppressing. Um, it, you know, human beings naturally, I think, don't actually like to see people in pain. And uh, in the, I think, you know, this is something when you look throughout history, it's the way that, um, you know, by by removing the humanity of the people that you're oppressing, it allows you to do terrible things to people. Um, and especially, you know, when we were looking at uh, the ways that people are, are trained to do these jobs. Uh, so, for example, going back to the play, when you look at the the scene uh, right at the end, where uh, one of the instructors is repeatedly being told, "You must call him a sub. You must call him a sub." Um, there's power in that. There's power to remove your ability to like access your humanity and your compassion by making this other person not human um, and the way that these words then uh kind of move into the like national consciousness and the way that we attach um images to those words make it so much easier for people to like uh, forget the fact that there are real human beings with lives who are being affected by these things um and so yeah like i mean language is one of the most important things the way it's the the fundamental of how we communicate um and it carries you know it carries ideas but without them having to be thought about in a way um so yeah i think you know la language is one of the key things it's one of this is something that has to be um, tackled. We have to find a way to remind ourselves in all of these um, situations that we are actually talking about human beings. Um, I hope I'm clear there. I think that um, yeah, that you've you've highlighted the use of language in discipline effectively, um, which is what a lot of these processes require. <laughs> um, is like its use in like disciplining the workforce um that that is effectively in part also being exploited to to undertake these crimes against humanity um i think that which makes the need for uh, language in the fight back as important but i think that the work is um even more difficult if you consider questions of co-option of depoliticization uh, the watering down by the establishment. And I think the perfect example of that has been the current uh, Black Lives Matter uprisings. We see, you know, uh, companies, sections of society that are, that have blood on their hands, that are incredibly exploitative, putting out statements using the hashtag of Black Lives Matter. That doesn't mean that we've won um, because, because, you know, the, lang the right language is being used. Um, this is all part of the process. And I think that um, it is as difficult um, to, uh, to ensure that, like to be vigilant and to ensure that complacency doesn't, um, doesn't settle in from like mass movements, from these campaigns, from these works and efforts um, as it did once before. I think we, Yes, I guess we see we need to learn from from the past, and we've seen what's happened with, you know, um, anti-racist movements. Those those the establishment has converted those into equality and diversity departments that again do far more of the disciplining than they do the liberating uh, of people of color and all oppressed groups within within those particular institutions and workspaces. Um, so I think that. It's the task around language is actually considerable, particularly in relation to uh, migration. Yeah, I think I'd also just like to add to that, um, just to bring it back for a moment to law, because um, it's so central, of course, to the play and to the title of the play, as Monish, um, as Monish was telling us, um, that actually legal categories in themselves, not just the category of the irregular migrant or the irregularized migrant, but also 
the category of the refugee, the category of the citizen, the category of the national, um, all of these um, legal categories actually play a role in normalizing and making acceptable violence in relation to some categories. So for example, the, the category of the refugee is, is, is relatively valorized, the kind of category where, okay, this is an individual deserving of protection. So, so, so we sort that individual into this, into this um, uh, uh, group that means that they're going to have um, access to rights and access to basic means of existence. And then of course, if you don't fall into that category um, of citizen or refugee, then well, you know, you're, you're, you're thrown under the bus for the, um, in the sense that you will be denied access to basic means of life, whether that's the kind of destitution, being left in destitution that we saw if, if you even make it um, to the jurisdiction of the state where you're, where you're seeking protection, um, or, or, you know, with often fatal consequences, whether you whether individuals um, um, make it to, to Britain or, or other um, countries or not. And so I think we have to be really careful about... Um, sort of seeing the way in which um, law itself and these legal categories are actually racial violence and and if we buy into these categories as being somehow acceptable and normal and 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 as and as corresponding to particular groups of people we actually miss the fact that that it is the act of categorization itself the act of communicating or speaking um individuals as falling into particular groups, um, which is the violence itself. And of course, categorization um, and the language of the law is so crucial to um, age old colonial processes. Um, you know, groups of people were were known through language, defined through language, filed under X as inferior, etc. Um, and this is how um, um, this is how colonialism operated um, exactly through a kind of um, um, putting in place of law or an order based on people being categorized as to whether or not they had access to rights. And you see all of that same um, um, pattern being reproduced in, of course, the immigration law of today, which, of course, is itself um, ra racial violence. Sorry, I forgot I was muted there. Uh, thank you, Nadine. And actually, that brings me on to the next question, which is about your book, Bordering Britain, and uh, about how the Home Office is a remnant of a colonial institution. I was wondering if you could tell us more about that. Um, well, I think the first thing I'd want to say is that immigration law and policy itself, um, it's not just shaped by colonial violence or a remnant, or if you like, of colonial violence, it is itself an extension of colonialism. It is itself a, an act of colonial violence. If you think about the way in which Britain, Britain was an empire before it was a so-called legitimately bordered sovereign nation state, I mean, I would contest that, but um, it was um, an empire until it, until it put its borders up and decided that um, um, its former colonial subjects and its Commonwealth and the Commonwealth and Commonwealth citizens who had a right to enter Britain um, couldn't do that. And so I think it's important to think um, about how Britain went about creating this idea of itself as being a sovereign nation state. Um, that can rightfully police its borders and um, leave people to die at home or to die trying to travel to Britain. And then indeed, when people arrive, gratitude obviously was such a theme in the play, make it out that actually everything you get, even though it's dirt, you should be grateful for. Rather than a more reparative kind of um, framework for understanding Britain, which is to say it's an ongoing colonial space, one that is rightfully contested, and that irregularized migrants are actually engaged in a, in a long history of anti-colonial resistance. And that actually, um, you know, people, racialized people should see themselves as deserving of um, Britain as a space and a place and everything within it, um, and, and as being entitled to that. Um, because actually it, it, it is a, itself a product of colonialism and it was what was stolen from them. And, you know, just to, I guess we can get into the law a little bit just for me to illustrate what I'm saying is, but um, in 1971, um, after sort of some decades of Britain's um, Britain losing its empire, essentially facing successive defeats, um, the government moved to prevent racialized people from being able to come to Britain. And it did so by basically saying that 
if you were born in Britain or you had a parent born in Britain, then you could um, um, have a right to enter and remain in Britain. So basically excluding the vast majority of racialized people from um, being allowed to come to Britain. At that time, 1971, Britain was 98% white. So you can see, of course, who was excluded by that legislation. And then you had the British Nationality Act in 1981, which built citizenship. So, so British citizenship on that same concept of patriality, the notion of being born, of being a parent born in Britain. And so what that did is basically tie citizenship um, to whiteness. And so the effect of that is that if you're within Britain, your, your right to be there becomes constantly present. Well, where are you really from? Well, you know, where did you really come from? And, um, you know, whatever you have here, you're lucky, you know, you're treated as a guest. There's no way um, as a racialized person you will ever be considered to actually be entitled to be in Britain. And, and, you know, the law plays such an important role in this as having constructed you as not belonging um, because you were not white. And of course, what it also did is raise this idea of Britain as being post-imperial. Um, as the empire being something that's now vanished in the past. Um, and it stopped people with histories of dispossession um, being able to travel to Britain and basically take back what, what was stolen from them. Um, and so, so I think, yeah, so I think it's important to bear in mind that immigration law is not some kind of harsh but fair mode of determining who has a right to live and who, and who doesn't in Britain and have access to resources in Britain. It is itself. Um, just a, a kind of final seizure of colonial wealth. You know, Britain's losing it, losing its possessions. What does it do? It pulls up the drawbridge, um, and and that and that and a whole new narrative begins. Britain is a nation state, a border nation state. Um, nobody has the right to come here unless we determine that. And I think we need to push back against that. We need to see that the law is this prop that it's used to teach people, to teach white British people that everything in Britain is theirs. Um, and actually, we need we need to push back against that narrative um, and try to change, like you were saying at the start, the language around who's entitled to what um, and, 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 and conceiving of irregularized migration more as 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 anti-colonial resistance. Thank you. Um, a huge part, I think, of that is also to convince uh, people, to, well, people think that in order for um, people seeking asylum or refugees to uh, be treated properly, that they have to give something up. There's always this idea that, you know, it's a pie and if you give a slice of that, that pie to someone else, you're going to lose out. Um, and um, I was wondering if maybe perhaps you, Malia, could um, talk to us a little bit about how even um, how the, there is this division within British society and how marginalized groups, even within uh, Britain itself, or you know, uh, the, the working class are pitted against these other communities to, to make it seem like there are, there's a limited amount of resources when actually um, there's just austerity. Yeah, I think um, the current pandemic um, has highlighted uh, effectively the most some of the most essential sections of our society um how but also the incredibly dire conditions i think that um it certainly wasn't a nice period but to see people that wouldn't have otherwise questioned working conditions rights um and uh questions of exploitation fair pay um, because they're now seeing who are on the front lines, who are disproportionately impacted, uh, who are necessary to effectively keep our society running, um, was quite crucial. It obviously didn't still kind of reinforce this good migrant, bad migrant narrative. Um, there was, I guess there's, there's particularly in light of um, what happened during that period as well, that there was a, a a worry that again complacency would would set in and as the the aggressivity of uh, austerity measures um start to set in as the reality of you know um of all those workers who are furloughed um are so many are expected to lose their jobs um that that solidarity quickly fizzles out but i think that uh, that is exactly the intentions of the state and the ways in which um uh, it's all set up and how we, we become so distracted with, with I guess, the struggles, the daily struggles and violence that we are um, surrounded by, uh, surrounded with the, um, and the spaces in which solidarity would otherwise build don't exist. But I think that this is part of 
like this is the nature of the processes in relation to migration, particularly illegal migration. The state is under no illusion that that it happens or that um, nor does it particularly seek uh, to stop it. Um, it. It needs certain structures like detention centers, like deportations in order to maintain the narrative um, that these people are dangerous, chaotic, coming to take something from you. Um, but it but it allows for you know uh, for, for the many that do exist and uh, contribute uh, to the economy that give their labor uh, to remain within the precarious um, position in society because then those people cannot join unions those people cannot organize they can't vote they cannot make political decisions um, I, I wouldn't want to because of the incredibly dangerous position they would put themselves in um, won't be taking on rogue landlords like you name it every every ill of society uh, to strip them of their right and ability to do so and that at times is what we forget in times of austerity even something minor like the free school meals over the summer holidays after a particular footballer had like applied pressure on Boris Johnson to issue it. Uh, what was forgotten is um, that how, how how is that inclusive of migrant children? Um, and, and that this whole kind of layer was slightly overlooked. I don't feel that that's the intention of those fighting for it by any means. It's just that uh, some of these like small things um, remind us of uh, yeah this entire layer of society that is highly exploited uh, disproportionately um um uh disproportionately exposed uh to violence to to danger um and a form of violence that is that is legitimized institutionalized um and uh whipped up for political agendas thank you um, and you mentioned the intentionality of the action. So, you know, the, the state needs these migrants to be in a precarious position. They need this cheap labor. Um, and um, I wanted to turn it back to Monish as well to talk about the harm of the actual home office and where and how the, the conditions that people seeking asylum live in, um, whether those are intentional or, not, or from your research, your field work, what have you discovered? Yeah. Um, so, in my recent article, which I, I, I've titled The Permission to be Cruel, uh, so, so the title explores this permission to be cruel and how bureaucrats and those responsible for the administration of asylum and immigration regime enact the state power and inflict cruelty on people seeking asylum. Uh, and this cruelty is inflicted through their actions uh, or inactions or intentional uh, uh, neglect. So I will give you an example of racist hate crimes directed against people seeking asylum. So uh, the state has designed a dispersal policy uh, and after the asylum in interviews are conducted, people are moved to location uh, and accommodation on a no choice basis. So previously, uh, people seeking asylum were moved to uh, places uh, according to their language clusters, but then the asylum housing became privatized and a lot of these asylum uh, people seeking asylum are now moved to remote parts of the country, uh, which are often deprived, but also they're moved there because uh, of the availability of cheap housing. Uh, there's no risk assessment conducted. Uh, and on top of that, state has actively deployed the us versus them politics that Malia was talking about that divides the group and produces hate. Um, so I encountered cases in the field where people seeking asylum were verbally abused uh, and threatened by the locals and, and they feared uh, imminent physical attacks. So several requests were made to the home office uh, and housing providers asking them to relocate these individuals. Uh, and the authorities uh, asked for more. Uh, what authorities did, did was that they were like, we only consider these requests if it's accompanied by evidence, uh, such as crime reference numbers or details of the attack. So the claim of being fearful or anticipating uh, racial attacks was not sufficient. 
uh, and out of four or five requests, only one was considered. So to consider, to be considered as genuine, uh, uh, to, to be considered uh, for relocation, you have to be genuine victims. Uh, so not only does that indicate a lack of prevention strategy uh, within the Home Office to protect vulnerable people, uh, but also uh, vulnerable people from becoming targets uh, of, of hate-related incidents, but also uh, reflects uh, on the abandonment of the duty uh, to protect life uh, as mandated by the uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission. Uh, so dispersal of asylum seekers uh, uh, in such areas followed by refusals to relocate uh, uh, them and consider the existence of trauma that asylum seekers are already going through makes this group even more vulnerable to racial attacks. And I would like to read out a quote from this woman called uh, Nia. Let me just open up the um, document. From Zimbabwe, who was moved into a remote corner of North, North England and, and uh, without any risk assessments of the area and the location. Uh, and this is what she said, uh, Nia, not her real name, from Zimbabwe. Uh, whenever I went out, these boys used to look at me in a bad way. At first, I thought it was just me being paranoid and going crazy. I was going to see the doctor again. Then they started calling me with dirty names. That kept happening for some time. Then they started throwing things at me and, and, and following me. Uh, then I started opening my window a little bit to see uh, if they're around, uh, if they were still standing outside. Uh, then I, I would stay inside. Sometimes they were there all day. I just sit inside and wait for them to leave. My GP wrote to the home office uh, and housing provider many times. And, and after, after uh, many months, they moved me uh, to a different location. Uh, and th there have been several cases where people have actually died as a result of, of the policy. And one of the very well publicized case would be that of uh, Bijan Abrami who was a disabled Iranian refugee, moved into a remote corner of Bristol. And on numerous occasions, he actually went uh, to the police, um, asking them to relocate him to a different place. And instead of taking his complaint seriously, they actually thought that he was the agitator. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, harms are often intentional. They're deliberate. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Manish. Um, I think that's... Yeah, it's horrendous. Um, we we have just a few minutes left, so I'm going to get uh, take an, audi uh, an audience question right now. And this question is from Margot. Um, she says, I live in Glasgow. The past few months have really shown the worst of the hostile environment and has led to two tragedies in the hotels where Mears and the Home Office have forcibly put people in after stopping their Section 4 support. Um, and her question is, how can we hold both Mears and the Home, of, Home Office accountable? How can we challenge them? Is there a legal mechanism to do so? Would other means of organizing work better? Um, and I think that's a, that's a question that any, anyone can jump in and uh, give their take on it. Thanks, Margot. Uh, and I think that's a really important question. I think since the attacks happened, it kind of made me think deeper about uh, about the entire situation. And I personally felt that um, it's really important to first start reflecting on the structural racism uh, and what asylum seekers are going through uh, to understand that this is, this is intentional uh, and, and it, the harm that's inflicted on them is intentional. The policy is designed to wear them out uh, and break their will so they, they return back to their uh, countries of origin. Uh, and there's, an, there's a term that describes this as we are living in deep apartheid Britain. And that's the only way we can understand the scenario. This is happening in deep apartheid Britain because everything is designed to inflict harm and push people out. So I'm going to leave this there and let others answer. Yes. Um, just briefly as well on this, I think um, sort of coming back to the experience of doing this play as well, there's a lot of these systems that work uh, via people being unaware and not um, listening to the stories of people. And um, the suffering that takes place 
Uh, it's happening all the time. It's happening under our noses, but in our names. So someone who uh, has grown up in this country, it's really easy for us to uh, like to forget that these things are happening. Um, and the very act of like telling your story and speaking out uh, and in like not allowing uh, the British citizen to become complacent to what is being done in their name, I think is like really important. Not that the onus is on the oppressed to do this, but um, it's important that we as British citizens like seek out these stories and seek out the truth of what is happening. Because um, I don't know, I, like there's a level of outrage that uh, is deliberately kept down by by dampening these voices. And the more that we speak about it, and the more that we just shine a light on what is actually happening, I think the more people will come to um, take some action. Um, yeah, I think you know the sharing of these stories is one of the most important things that we can do and it's like the first part of the conversation but it's a really important one and it's often difficult and not easy but is necessary and um yeah i don't know it is transformative but the very fact of having those conversations becomes transformative in itself i think i would just want to add really quickly to that is that um it's not just that these that the cruelty and that that the instances that that the person that asked the question talked about are, are intentional. Um, they're also not exceptional. And I think it's also on us to kind of connect the dots in relation to the racialized violence that is so normalized in this country, but which we are made to think is exceptional. Like, okay, this is happening to these people because they're here illegally and they don't have a right to be here. Or well, this is happening to these people because, um, you know they they broke the law so you know they don't count as good law-abiding migrants so they can be deported um if we look at grenfell another example where that that um very same argument was made around well these people you know they shouldn't be here anyway they should be grateful to have a roof over their head um and those kinds of um you know but actually if you look at all those instances of of, of violence um whether it's in a detention center whether it's in people's own homes like in the case of Grenfell whether it's the Windrush generation how and, and what happened to them in the in the wake of hostile environment um those who are convicted of um of crimes of course and sentenced for more than 12 months were automatically deported even though um they shouldn't have been um according to they shouldn't be anyway but but even those who you know that those who were um, deported um, um, despite having a legal right to be in Britain, which was of course then denied them through the hostile environment policy, well they're not you know, taken into account when it comes to the task force and the compensation etc. Um, and, and it's precisely this kind of divisive um, language and modes of governing that we're subjected to that means that if we buy into the notion that well if you don't have a right to be here then basically we can just wash our hands of you um, you 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 are buying into the idea that some people um, that where people are subject to injustice that's somehow exceptional, but actually it's totally normalised and it has a very long history. You know, the the British state has a very long history of um, of um, splitting up fat racialized families. If we go back to even transatlantic slave, slavery to refusal of family reunification today, I mean there are um, you know taking children away from their uh, um, parents in the course of um, um, settler colonial conquest and you know removing indigenous children from families I mean all of these kinds of instances in history are really relevant now and I think we need to be connecting those dots in order to be able to tackle racial violence that occurs today rather than see it as exceptional or, or kind of we just need to deal with this one little problem forget about the rest but actually try to connect these dots. Um, thank you thank you very much. Ma Malia do you want to um, add anything to that? Yeah, I think that um, particularly partly because of um, the, the strain during the pandemic um, and other political events, uh, like this is an important, an, an important time mobilisation. And I think that um, we need to recognise that the state is not going to, that uh, nothing transformative, <laughs> remotely radical, um, uh, will happen unless uh, the heat is felt from below, if pressure is applied. Um, I think when over a thousand people were released from um, 
from detention centers, people thought, well, you know, chaos didn't hit our streets. There wasn't an alarming rise in crime and they weren't taking, stealing our children and whatever other horrific scapegoating tends to happen by the right. Um, so maybe from this, you know, the government will learn that they'll they'll change them and they'll realize this process is unnecessary assuming that he even had that intention that, that this was just a process it had always done it and didn't know any better and it was effective and that was that and we have to like you have to assume the worst because it like that that is exactly the point from which uh, the state functions and uh, issues its violence um uh and and institutionalizes it through these many <laughs> different ways and so I think that, yes, organize. My advice is to organize, to always organize wherever, where it's, whether it's your workplace, whether it's your building, whether it's your local community, whether it's your faith spaces, in whatever capacity. And I think that um, this is, as, as we enter one of, you know, potentially the worst financial crisis that the, the, the UK has ever had, um, we have to be as prepared as the government already is uh, to issue our demands and expectations and to apply enough pressure, um, including um, the rights and freedoms of migrants. Um, however utopic we're accused of, um, uh, that, that we may be accused uh, uh, that like those demands are, um, but we have to, but it has to start from the point that we believe that it is possible in order for us to fight to make it possible and so that's just my message thank you thank I, I i totally agree and i think that's also the purpose of this platform as well to build that solidarity and try to unite you know people who um feel the same way who think the same way um unfortunately we've run out of time and i was wondering whether you have any final reflections just before we sign off no uh thank you so much uh, um, for being here. Thank you for watching and to everyone uh, at home. Uh, I wanted to tell you that the next event that we will be hosting will be on the 20th of July and uh, we will be streaming Heavens by a Lebanese company, Zoukak Theatre. Um, it's an incredible piece and I really hope that you'll tune in and watch it. Um, if you have any more comments, you can always send them to us on social media and if you have any other um, questions then maybe we can ask. Uh, sorry, we can answer <laughs> rather. Um, and just thank you everyone for being here.